Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Newman. I'm the co-founder of the Four Minute Screenplay Competition. And today I'm very fortunate to have with me Naomi Wollaston and Rishi Kapoor. Hey, Daniel. <laughs> so uh, allow me to introduce Naomi Wollaston. Uh, she's the head of scripts for the Liftoff Global Network, which hosts dozens of film festivals, both online and offline throughout the world every year. So Naomi, uh, where are you speaking to us from today? Hey everyone, uh, I'm speaking to you from High Wycombe, which is just outside of London, easiest way to, uh, to say that. But uh, where I work is actually at Pinewood Studios, which some of you may know. Uh, it's a very cool area at the moment. Uh, still filming going on, so that's nice due to uh, COVID. We're still, we're still getting there. Excellent. So yeah, that's where my office is up. Okay, and uh, let me also introduce you all to Rishi Kapoor, who's the CEO of the short film at Pause, which is revolutionizing the streaming industry by allowing users to directly tip the filmmakers. So Rishi, uh, where are you today? Um, I'm dialing in from sunny Manchester, um, my home, and I've been working from home <laughs> since March pretty much, so the walls are slowly closing in on me. Um, but great, great to be here, Daniel. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Yes. And well, of course, what I should have said earlier is that both Naomi and Rishi are going to be helping us to judge this year's four minute screenplay competition. So I thought it might be interesting for all you screenwriters out there to know what kind of thing they're looking for when they look at a short script. Um, so Rishi, perhaps I can ask you the first question of the day. Um, I wanted to know why are screenwriting and storytelling important to you and your colleagues at Pause? If you're like me and you believe that storytelling has something to do with our culture and, and really a large part of our lives, I think it's really ingrained everything we see on TV, whether it be through media, books, news, films, TV series. Stories are so important to our culture and one of the reasons why we started Pause was to try and champion diversity in storytelling and try and get those stories that maybe aren't going to be told on wider, big commercial streaming platforms. And that's why we decided to launch around streaming platforms so we can showcase unique stories that might not have that commercial appeal. So for me, it's, it's the, the, you know, one of the most fundamental, fundamental things about stories is that so many people can resonate with a story and see themselves reflected in it, regardless of whether they have had a personal experience with that story. Um, and, and the great thing about stories is that it can touch so many people. So Naomi, where that you did a degree in film and TV production. So I wanted to start by asking you what that taught you about script writing and how do you use that knowledge uh, when working for the Liftoff Global Network? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, as a kid, I've always loved films. I was obsessed with films. I still am. Um, so it was always something that I was interested in, but I came from quite a novel background. I loved writing little short stories, um, even trying to write novels myself. So when I went into university, I didn't really realise the difference between scripts and novels. And there's a lot of difference. <laughs> Um, I was shocked on my first year when I wrote my, what, what I thought was not my first script, but really it was. Um, and I got back saying, this, this is a novel, this, this is not a script. Um, I learned that to write a script, you really have to write the essentials, what you see on screen and nothing else. Um, I love characters, so I love writing about my characters, but I have to show that on screen. So whoever my characters are, how they talk, what they wear, Let's say, for example, I have someone that's feeling a bit down. How do I represent that on screen? Okay, well, maybe she's got highlights and maybe they're growing out as opposed to saying in a novel, you know, like, oh, she's gone through this, she's gone through that. Um, so I really learned how to put a story into visuals as opposed to reading it. Um, and that's something that I keep hyper focus on when I, when I get the scripts into lift off. It's, Am I seeing everything I need to see? And am I seeing it in the right way? Is it engaging for me? Okay, yeah. So, so yeah, so take notes, all you screenwriters out there, lots of good tips already. <laughs> and well, uh, Rishi, could I ask you, um, what will you be looking for in particular 
uh, when choosing your favorite screenplays for this year's competition? Um, two main things. Originality, obviously, I think that's, that's um, fairly, I think that's a given. I also think being smart about the way you tell a story as well. I, I think that oh, the, the, the most common is telling stories in a linear chronological way. I think there's an interesting way of you telling your story um, and being smart about it, adding in perhaps layers. Um, that's what I'll be. That's what I'll be looking for the most. And that you know that could include a, a huge twist at the end. Um, I always think the start, middle, the end of a story are super important. So it needs to be captivating from the very start. It needs to have a super great ending. An ending that actually makes someone think about the film after. I think that's the hardest thing with a film is you you want your audience to walk away and think about your film the next day. Yeah. Um, and I, however you do that, whether it's at the middle um, start or at the end, um, or, or, or right the way through, try and do something where someone thinks about it, either in a good way, makes them laugh or, or makes them ponder. Um, and, and, you know, not only being original with the story, but I think if there's, there's an interesting way um, from, a, from a timeline point of view, that would be super cool as well. So I'll be looking for those two things. Okay, excellent. And Naomi, if I go back to you now, um, and I wanted to ask you about the difference between a four minute screenplay and a 10 minute screenplay, because of course, last year when we ran this competition, it was a strict rule, four minutes only, a maximum of around about four pages. Uh, but yeah. this year we're being a bit more flexible and we're allowing people to submit up to 10 pages. And I just wondered how you might advise a screenwriter uh, how they might go about tackling 10 pages differently. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'd say the core concept is, is the same. Um, to go to sort of extend on what Rishi was saying, um, I always look for a succinct narrative regardless of how many pages this script has. Uh, I like to see an arc. With four pages, um, it sounds short, but really four minutes is quite a long time as well. And so 10, you're asking quite a lot from an audience that have such an extensive amount of uh, information out there and entertainment out there to, to sit down and read a 10 minute script um, and a four minute script. Um, so I would say as long as it has a succinct arc, uh, regardless of the page count, it will be entertaining to read. But with more pages, you can delve into the characters a bit more. I'm biased because I'm such a character driven person. But if you have 10 pages, you can really expand on a few, maybe even tease out a few subplots that might happen. You don't have to address it. Um, but to get the, the writer, the reader, sorry, to get the reader thinking, where is this going? What else is in this person's life? How was their day yesterday? What's going to happen tomorrow? I love having questions like that when I'm reading a script because you get invested immediately. So I want the story to be succinct, to end well, but I would also like in a 10 page script to have a few little questions thrown in there to, um, to keep me thinking. After, after I finish the script, I want to keep thinking about the characters that I meet. Sure, and I, I think we're keen as well, because of course I'm going to be one of the judges along with uh, Tom Lincoln, who I set the competition up with. And we're certainly keen to find screenplays that have the potential to be turned into, into a bigger projects, perhaps a feature film or a, or a series. So I quite like what you were saying there about uh, sort of hints at subplots that might, might be uh, expanded into something larger in the future. Another difference about this year's competition is that we're focusing purely on comedy. So last year there were no genre restrictions, uh, but this year it has to be comedy of one sort or another. Um, I was wondering whether you could tell us what you think makes for a, a good comedy screenplay. Well, comedy is probably the hardest genre to get right. So it's a good, it's a good competition because it's, it is, it's hard. And I think it's hard because maybe it's so subjective what one person finds funny as someone else doesn't, maybe. Um, I, I, I don't quite know why comedy is so hard to get right. And, and I think it makes for a really strong competition. So, you know, if I knew the answer to what makes great comedy, then I would be writing to the comedy. So the, the honest answer is I, I don't, I don't know what makes a great comedy. I, I think it's, um, 
What I, I find is with, with the characters and also the way they perceive real life situations. And I find that really strong in comedy as well. Um, I think, uh, I'm trying to remember, oh, Fleabag um, is a really, really good example, right? It's, it's a, a person that maybe lots of people could relate to. It's, it's a kind of real, real person but speaks in a way that's unconventional. And I think that I was watching an, another program called Succession, and it was a big kind of HBO budget series. But there's a couple of characters in there that just, you won't necessarily be able to relate to them as characters, but they speak in a way that's completely unconventional and witty. And I think if you delve into the characters and tease out things, because we all, we all th think things that we wouldn't say, and I think when you write something in comedy, you can actually maybe use your characters to, to say things that you're thinking that you can't say out loud. Uh, don't make characters into caricatures, I think, is probably the one big thing. I think subtlety in comedy is really important. So um, sometimes the things that are funny is, it, it, are, are the bits within the script. It could be a facial expression, it could be a side glance, it could be someone's reaction. And I think when people try and make overemphasize a character to try and force out comedy that's when things get difficult um and so just to going back to the streaming service we've got a number of, of fantastic um comedies and they're they're just so smart in the use of not necessarily the the, the characters but it's the space in between the characters it's the reactions of other characters it's the silences in between the scripts that make it so powerful so i would um I'm, it's not a shameless plug, but I would, I would ask, you know, suggest people go into the app, have a look at some of the comedies that we have, because there's a huge range as well. Um, I also, I don't think, and this might sound weird, comedies don't have to be funny throughout the entire thing, especially if you've got a lot of time to play with. I think sometimes with a good comedy, the, the, the comedy comes into the relief part of it. So, so if you can kind of contrast it with something, going back to B plots and, and subplots within, within a, um, a script, if you can contrast it with something maybe more serious, it gives more heart to the comedy and, mm -hmm. and makes the comedy parts a bit more punchy. So I wouldn't necessarily think just because you're writing a comedy, the entire thing has to be a comedy. I think you can have some more serious themes that run throughout it as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my, but honestly, Daniel, if I, if I knew what makes a strong comedy, I'd be writing comedies. Well, it's, it's interesting because last week I interviewed Luke Graves, who was the screenwriter that was one of the winners last year, and he wrote Angel Falls, but he's also a stand-up comedian. And I was asking him about the relationship between the two careers, and he said that people often incorrectly assume that you have to hit a certain number of jokes per minute. You have to have a certain number of punchlines. And he said that's not what's important but rather that you hold the audience's interest. So uh, some common ground there. Um, and I thought perhaps I could ask you both uh, to give me some examples of some great comic films that you've seen recently on your respective platforms. So Naomi, maybe I could start with you. Could you tell me the, the names of any uh, screenwriters or films that you've had on one of the liftoff festivals recently that you thought was particularly funny? Yeah, sure. Um, so last year we had a, a short film come through to us uh, and it was all filmed in one take. It was called On End 15, um, directed and written by Joseph Archer. Um, it was hilarious. It was basically uh, about a band, quite a young band in England and they had a live show uh, and, what, and the drummer got so drunk he passed out and it was 15 minutes of them rushing around trying to figure out a solution. It was incredible how it was all filmed in one shot um it's been making waves through to through all the festivals and we're so proud of him but um it it goes back to saying if you throw empathetic characters into crazy situations those characters act as an anchor and you can really kind of do anything with them so if you keep throwing obstacles at them that you're just like what is going on? How on earth are they going to get through with this? And you empathize with them. It creates such a funny, ridiculous and unbelievably enjoyable film. So I always think of that one when I think of uh, what comes through to us. Um, this Monday gone, we just had a screenwriter roundtable. We got a script from a guy called Nick and it was, it was basically a, um, 
a mixture of inside out and 40 year old virgin. So it was about, it was about how to go about dating uh, and you go into his mind and you see all this chaos of what do I do? Uh, you see like other neurons acting all uh, <laughs> very inappropriately and other neurons trying to be, you know, we need to do this. We need to, you know, we need to get this woman's attention and, and get what we need to get. And it, that was really funny. Yeah. Um, from a stand up comedian, you could definitely tell. But again, it does go back to making the characters relatable. That's why it's funny. If you can't relate to what you're seeing, you're just sort of left in this weird atmosphere of like, what's going on? <laughs> so I think you definitely need that anchor, whoever it is, um, or whatever it is. I guess it doesn't really have to be a character, but something that you relate to that can bring you back down so that whatever ridiculous thing you're watching, you, you can be like, if I was in that situation, what on earth would I do? Okay, this person's doing that. That's hilarious. <laughs> What comic gems have you uh, enjoyed on the pause app recently? So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick out two just because I think they're really smart in the way they've been done. Uh, one is called Lobsters by Matt Huntley. And the other one is called Taking Stock by uh, Duncan Cowles. I think they're really smart in the use of comedy just because there's, there's, no, there's, there's actually not a... Obviously, it's scripted, but you don't have two characters talking. There's no dialogue. It's just it's purely narrated. And what I love about it is that, especially with lobsters, you don't actually, um, you don't realise it's a comedy until kind of part way through, where you think, oh, wow, this is, I, I, I understand, this, I, this is going in one direction, it's completely taking me to in, in another. Also great use of an accent as well, um, which is important. Um, so I think those two are, are really smart examples of how you can be going back to, you know, what we're looking for, something original. And taking stock in particular, that there's actually no characters in that, there's, there's no actors, there's no dialogue. It's pure, purely narrated, and it's really uh, clever how how they've how they've done it. So those two, I think, are really interesting comedies to uh, reference when thinking about how can I do something that, first of all, isn't comedy straight away. So it's a clever use of of the genre, and it isn't that sort of joke per minute type of comedy it's much more subtle and it's much smarter. So you're not kind of like, you're not rolling over and laughing the entire way through, but you think about it like, that's actually hilarious what they've done there. It's absolutely hilarious. And I, and I think it's, um, they're, they're, they're great references. So yeah. check them out. Yeah, I've actually seen uh, Taking Stock and I agree with you. I really like that one as well. Very, very dry humour. Oh, and the, another one actually is, is The Legend of Bob Leonard by Will Kenning, which is also on our platform. We were going to do a screening of that. Um, which we, we're now going to do next year. Um, it's it's a it's a period um, comedy, and again, just a, that that is I think in, from from a script point of view, it's super ambitious from the start, well produced, well executed. Um, but again, it's it's got it's it's gritty, it's it's gruel, it's it's um, grotesque in parts, and and it is that sort of laugh out loud comedy. Um, and you know, I I've, I very rarely see comedy mixed with um, a, a period piece as well. It tends to be drama when it comes to independent films. So I really like that kind of mix of genres there. So um, so yeah, three very different films. Obviously, two of them have something in common. But I would check all those three out to see a really good range of comedies. We'll add a link, obviously, to the uh, to the way people can download the Pause app as well and and check out those films too. Um, I'm really excited to work with with both of you because both Liftoff and Pause, in my mind, are you know doing a great job of providing independent filmmakers and screenwriters with an, an opportunity to get their work out there uh, and to progress their careers. And that's what I wanted to ask you both about next. Um, and perhaps Naomi, I could start with you. Uh, could you tell us about some of the many ways in which Liftoff helps create opportunities for independent screenwriters and filmmakers to lift off? Of course. Um, so we have we have so many things actually, <laughs> and because it's all tailor made to whoever comes through to us. So we've got things like the festivals themselves, which just offer the exposure. Um, we have on our membership platform, a uh, production accelerator course, which is, I guess, sort of like a mini university course. You go through um, from the very concept of, of an idea 
it takes you through the the it takes you through a structure to sort of uh, work it out, uh, write the script, try to find people who you can collaborate with. Um, it gives you worksheets and assignments to do to keep you motivated because. For me, uh, that's probably the biggest issue on my part is to, you know, you get greeted with a blank sheet of paper and you're like, oh my God, where do I start? Um, that's something that we like to address because it's like you can wait around for something to spark your, uh, your imagination or you can just sit down and write something. We like to be like, write something and go from there. So that's what the production accelerator can help with. Um, we have film market representations, so we have applications come through to us, things like just even concepts that we take to the, to the market um, and meet with producers and uh, potential buyers that, that are interested. Um, we host in, uh, meetings with those kinds of people. Unfortunately, it was all uh, virtual this year, but um, previous years we'd actually go to the market, so AFM and CAN and stuff like that, and uh, we'd, we'd take some of our some of our best members work with us, um, which we love. Uh, we also have a really big networking platform that sort of greets everyone in the industry that we have together. So we'd, we'd get a writer and then we'd get a director speaking. Let's say that they're, they're close in terms of location. Uh, we encourage them to speak to each other to then sort of come up with a team, really build teams themselves, because we've noticed, especially as independent filmmakers, looking at the film industry from an outside perspective seems so just so unaccessible um i know it did for me when i was at university i thought my god how on earth am i ever going to get into this industry uh that's something we we want to cease to exist so we are so focused on independent filmmakers that we kind of tailor what we can offer to each one so for our scripts, we have round tables. We ask them where they want to go with it. Um, someone could say, I want to make it into a feature. Someone could say, I'm really looking for concept art. Another person would say, I'm really looking for a producer or another co-writer. Um, we listen to those and we, we make those connections for them. Um, that's, our, that's our main objective is to just listen to everyone that comes through to us, find out what they need, point them in the right direction, offer them all the support that we possibly can. Nice. Well, it sounds like there's there's lots of different ways in which you help there. That's great. Um, Rishi, could I ask you uh, the same question? We are a streaming service. We're dedicated to um, independent films. And the way we work is that we allow filmmakers to monetize directly from their fans. And the way we do that is through individual tipping. So there's a recognition here with Pause, just like you would go to something like Patreon to support your favorite musician, or you would go to Kickstarter to kick to to to, to kickstart a film or a crowdfund the film or Indiegogo. It's kind of the 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 opposite end of that, where you watch a film, and as a as an audience, you watch it for free, no monthly subscriptions, no annual payments, no adverts, which is important to us. Um, and instead, we allow audiences to give back any amount they want with no upper limit to any film, to any filmmaker, and 80% of every single payment goes back to the filmmaker directly. Um, and we've had some, you know, our, our average payment on pause right now is, is over nine pounds per, so, so that's, that's per tipping view. So one, one viewer can tip you nine pounds, which is a sharp contrast to the kind of earnings you would expect on, on other platforms. Um, and so the, you know, our model is really what gives filmmakers the opportunity give you some some examples we have one filmmaker 17 years old first film this is almost like a zero budget film right he had 36 quid and and he spent it on props and he made a film um we also do by the way we also do live events as you know daniel we do live screenings um which actually wasn't really in response to COVID 19 or cinemas closing down but it's now become super relevant um so we enable any film or any filmmaker to have a live digital premiere for their film. It's global, anyone in the world can join, anyone in the world can tip as well, all on pause. And we do this cool thing where we screen the film and people can tip live as well. We give people a three minute window where they can tip. And, and again, 80% goes back to the filmmaker. And then there's a Q and A after where people can ask questions to the filmmaker um, and we have a kind of chat. So we do live events, live screenings, and we also do, we also have our on-demand app, which is soon going to be from next month, 
not only on iOS, but on Android, desktop, um, and tablet. You can ping across to your big screen TV through Chromecast or AirPlay. You can download films to watch later. So we've got a whole new setup coming just before Christmas. Um, and it's really a model that gives filmmakers opportunities. So going back to this young 17 year old kid who made a film for 36 pounds, uh, put it on pause and day one earned 600 pounds in tips from, from, from audiences, right? That's, that's it's his first film and he's 17 years old and his actor was his brother. They live in the same house. They were in lockdown and made it in his, in his room. Great film, um, especially for someone's like first time making a film. And that then, you know, for someone like him, right, he's now got 600 pounds minus 36 pounds he spent on his film to then spend on his next film without having to go and get grant funding from someone like the BFI, without having to rely on commissioners, without having to rely on institutions. We're, we're providing a, a self-sustaining ecosystem around filmmakers and their audiences that they can earn directly from them without any interjection. And, and there's a, an amazing trend, be it online gamers with Twitch or musicians or poets or podcasters on Himalaya, whoever it might be, that super fans or fans in general want to give back to creators. You can't do that on a subscription-based platform. You certainly can't do that on an ad-based platform. You can't do that on a, a platform where there's set transactions and set payments. And you can't do that when a big platform takes most of the earnings anyway, which, which platforms do. And you know, musicians have equally as a hard time as filmmakers. Um, and so our model is, for us, the most powerful tool that filmmakers have to monetize directly. It's also financially inclusive for the audience as well. You can watch it. You don't have to tip. We encourage everyone who watches to tip. But if it's not to your liking, you, you obviously don't have to. And the, the big reward is you're watching something that's genuinely free. Not only is it free of payments, but it's free of adverts. So when people go on something like a YouTube and they think they're watching stuff for free, they really aren't because you're having to obviously sacrifice some form of personal data that goes back to a big platform and that's not necessarily speaking free so we are we're, we're a great viewing experience for for audiences and you know that's one example we've had filmmakers earn over one and a half grand on our platform um within a very short space of time um and again for some it's beer money for some it's i'm going to use this to fund my next film and we're just getting started right so our our system is powerful we're giving back to filmmakers. We're creating an economy that surrounds the filmmakers and their audiences. And that's how, for me, you know, the, the film industry, the independent film industry has always kind of struggled. And, and it's becoming worse as big studios and big streamers focus more on sort of in-house original studio-led content and franchises. And, and by the way, I used, that's what I used to do as a job um, for, for many years at Warner Brothers, then at Disney and at Sony Pictures and at Universal. And I completely switched to focus on the independent film sector because th the thing that's broken is the economics of it. It's not the demand. The demand is there massively. You know, 70% of all streamers are looking for independent content. That's, that's, that's globally. Right? So th there's huge demand for independent films. So why on earth is it, is it struggling? Why on earth do independent filmmakers so struggle to sustain themselves? It's one to do with the models and the metrics and the economy around it, which is exactly what Pause is here to do by removing all barriers and saying, look, if you're a filmmaker, you've got something to stay, you've got a good story, and you might get 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 people to watch your film, whoever might, how many people might be, you can earn effectively from them, you can earn directly from those fans. They give back directly to you any amount they want. There is no upper limit, and you keep pretty much everything you earn. Go and make your next film with that. And if we can empower filmmakers to earn a living or even fund or part fund the next project, there is no reliance then on, I have to wait for grant funding. I have to go to an institution and submit an application and wait for months. No, you don't need to do any of that. Build a, build a business around your audience, build a business around your fans, get them to support you and use that to make your next, your next film. And you can start as a 70 year old kid in your room with your brother on 36 pounds and start your business as a filmmaker today. And I think that's the most powerful thing that we can give. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens to this 17 year old filmmaker and where his <laughs> career goes. I, I imagine you'll both produce some, some superstars of the future. So Naomi, I wanted to ask you a bit about how things have changed in 2020 for uh, the Liftoff Global Network. 
obviously coronavirus has uh, made things difficult for everybody. Uh, and I wondered how you've adapted your business uh, in order to, to deal with this situation as best as possible. Sure. So normally we would host two different types of festivals um, at the same time. So we'd have our loco location based festivals um, in person, uh, in cool cinemas, in up and coming venues. Um, unfortunately, we've had to postpone that. Um, you know, hopefully we'll get back on track when, when COVID is over, but we've migrated that over onto our online Vimeo VOD platform, um, which has actually showed us that um, there's been a huge benefit to that because we've been able to uh, include a lot more filmmakers, give them a bigger platform because more filmmakers bring more audiences. We've had a, we've had a great increase in, in the audience interactions with our with the films that we're showcasing. So in a way, it's actually been incredible. <laughs> it's just been a shame that we can't go and see these filmmakers in person. So a way to get around that is that we've hosted uh, roundtables, pretty much like we're doing now. We get to meet everyone virtually um, to make sure that our networking events are running and that we still get to allow people to meet other people in the industry and create this te the teams that way because we would do uh, we would host the festival and then do a networking event afterwards for all of the filmmakers involved so all the local people that are working in the industry there can all meet each other and talk about their next projects and build teams that way and find producers and find the people that they're missing that way so we've had to take that online um it, it was it's doable it's still doable now um it's just a shame that selfishly we can't be there smiling in the background watching it all happen in real <laughs> in real life um so yeah so we've done we've migrated a lot of stuff over onto our youtube channel as well actually um things like q a's with the filmmakers and the writers um which has also been great because that's been um shown to a lot a wider audience as well so a lot more people kind of know what we're doing so that's been amazing it has been really it's been a big learning curve and we're very happy it's happened because it's shown us a lot of ways that we can enhance and grow as a company. So yeah, it's been a positive, but we also still cannot wait to, uh, to go back to the locations and meet all these filmmakers in person and just enjoy time together. Um, so when, whenever COVID is over, I don't want to jinx it, um, we will be doing both. So we'll be going back to our in-person festivals, but also still having this, um, this VOD platform to, to bring in as many filmmakers as we can and show, show them off and build as many teams as possible. Um, it's been a blessing. It has been a blessing. Um, working with film festivals for live stream and video on demand, because obviously you've got the technology to do that. Yeah, so, so we have partnerships with some amazing film festivals like the, the Raindance Film Festival, uh, the International Animation Festival. Um, we've got, we, we'll hopefully be doing a good partnership with RADA um, and we've had a number of conversations with, with companies like BAFTA, Glasgow Film Festival, the Japan Independent Film Festival, um, the Independent Filmmaker Project. Um, a, a good, good conversations um, and, and hopefully a, a strong partnership in 2021 with the British Urban Film Festival. Um, so we, we, what we're attempting to do is bring in as many film festivals. Because what's happening now is, I suppose lots of film festivals looking at this and thinking, A, um, I, I may not be able to run my film festival again, or B, I will run it, but there's always gonna be some digital part. And I think for me, it's, it'll be inconceivable that every festival will just go back to normal straight away especially having seen the value of online streaming um and so what, what we're trying to do is provide a digital outlet so we can create partner channels on four so we can have a selection from rain dance um a selection from the bolton film festival if we want to for example we, we can have channels on our service and playlists dedicated to film festivals so that's all in one space because we're going to have this interesting thing where every festival is going to set up their own streaming service. So audiences are going to be split across them because there's only so much appetite and room that someone has to go onto different online platforms to consume content. 
And actually, if you've subscribed to Netflix and you've got Amazon, you've got Disney Plus, your wallet, your mental wallet, as well as your physical wallet, is is um, is, is finite, right? And 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 you're not going to stream content from 100 different platforms. And so my my sell always to to film festivals is join a service that's dedicated to independent films, but one that really empowers the filmmakers as well and gives you your digital outlet, your digital streaming service that has full functionality, Chromecast, AirPlay, downloading, the, the same, you know, our service level is 99.5%, right? So we have the same streaming quality as something like Netflix or Amazon come December th uh, this year, so come next month. Um, oh, this month, actually, we're in December. Come in, 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 in about three weeks' time. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm always trying to bring on as many partners as possible. Rain Dance has given us a ton of films they represented a load of filmmakers. They brought them onto our platform, and those filmmakers are going to earn directly from the people who are watching um, them on pause. But Raindance have their digital presence, and and as a festival, uh, Naomi, you'll know that actually digitizing your content offering means that you're not just closing off your content to the few people who can attend a physical event at a certain point in time. You open it your your audience. You make it global. You make it year round. You can increase the number of filmmakers that you can represent. Um, and we're, we're doing the same thing, but what we're trying to do is create a dedicated home for every festival to, to, to come on and and so that audiences can cross-pollinate against each other. Because if you're a fan of Liftoff, it doesn't mean you're not going to be a fan of any other festival, right? You're, you're a true, authentic, independent film fan, so you'll enjoy content from, from other festivals as well. So we, we, we want to try and bring in as much of that that... Uh, cross pollination of of audiences as possible across festivals, so they're not they're not split. Uh, and and for us, definitely, we have the we have the the the, the leading uh, market value there, both for filmmakers and audiences. It being free, but also being powerful for filmmakers as well. Um, and in terms of functionality too, and, and the way that we can have branded channels on our site dedicated to a festival, branded playlists. Um, and then also our live events as well. We, we were doing live, by the way, it has to be said, before it was popular to do live events. I know, I know live events is like the cool thing now, but we were doing live events like before it became a big thing. And, um, and, and again, it's, it's a, a great way to showcase new up and coming filmmakers. Our, again, our, our ethos is everyone deserves to have a premiere for their film. I've been to a ton of, you know, in my time at studios, I would go to a premiere every single month for a, a big budget franchise film. And I looked at this and I thought, everyone should have this opportunity to do this, right? And I've been to Q and A's with, with you know, big, big stars and, and celebrities who have screened films. And I thought everyone should have a platform to be able to speak about their film that they spent such a, a long time making. So again, we have, we can now do live, I say now, as of, in two weeks, we can do live within app as well. At the moment, it's just on, on desktop. So we can have a live event within a mobile app. Um, you can ping it across to your big screen TV. So we're, we're trying to optimize the viewing experience for audiences as well and, uh, and, and provide as much value as possible. We, we, we're creating a community, right? a community of people who are super fans of independent film. So, um, and, and for us, it, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting time because obviously we're streaming services and they've all experienced a boom since uh, coronavirus has happened because people are at home more. But going back into it, I'd be surprised if every single festival would go back and, and completely dismiss digital streaming as a complementary service to their event. Right? I think everyone has seen now the value that home entertainment has um, in terms of expanding an audience. It's just expensive to do, but we, we bear the cost, right? It's free to use us. If you're a festival, it is free to use pause for your digital streaming um, provider. So you can have a rain dance TV style service on pause for free, as long as you bring your audience there, as long as, as long as they're supportive audiences that want to tip. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you both of you, um, because I'm a big fan of, of both of your companies. And I'm also very grateful that you both decided to, to get involved with this competition. Um, and I thought perhaps we could finish uh, by telling our viewers um, where they can find out more about your company. So Naomi, um, where can 
where can we find out more about the Liftoff Global Network? Sure. So just on our website, which is liftoff.network, um, on all of our social medias, which is Liftoff Global Network, uh, our YouTube as well, that's one of the best places we have our news and and we have our roundtables and we have we have everything that we do for our filmmakers and our script writers on there. So if, if anyone's interested in becoming part of our family, please have a look, see if it's see if it's for you. I'm sure it will be. We're excited to have you on board. Um, yeah, so just search Lift Off Global Network in any social media and we'll pop up. Um, happy to have you. Happy to I'm happy to be here. So thank you for for asking me to and I'm really excited to see these scripts that come through to you. Very yeah. excited. We've just actually extended the application deadline, the submission deadline, because the the deadline was the first of December, but in order to I, I know there's always people that are sort of about to finish and then they just miss the deadline. So for their sake, uh, and to give us a bit more time to read through all of the submissions we've already received, we're extending the deadline to the 14th of December. So you, so if you haven't submitted so far, you've still got time, you've still got two weeks. Um, yeah, Rishi, maybe you could also tell us about where people can find out more about PAUSE and where they can download the app. So uh, just head to pause.tv, P-A-U-S.tv. Our Instagram is the exact same, P-A-U-S.tv, pause.tv, and uh, that's where we'll redirect you to whether you're an Android user, an iPhone user, or you can watch it just on your desktop as well. Um, and, uh, and yeah, give us a follow on Instagram and uh, have a look at our website where you can get more information about our app. Brilliant.